Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. If you were to take an opinion poll amongst sea anglers to determine Britain's best overall fishing baits, the top three would probably come out something like worm, mackerel and squid, and more than likely in that order. But if you were to put the same question to fish, which obviously you can't in a direct sense, though you can do it by experimentation, then the answer would in many cases come out very differently, with peeler crab being very firmly planted at the top of the menu. As sea anglers know only too well, many species of fish love to eat crabs. The problem is that for much of the time, crab simply isn't available in a manageable form, though some fish, as we'll explore later, don't seem to see that as too much of an obstacle. That said, the vast majority of fish either can't be bothered with, or simply can't manage the crab's tough exoskeleton. Fortunately, at certain times they don't need to, because unlike animals with internal skeletons which grow with them, crabs can only achieve growth by getting rid of their old suit of armour and replacing it with a new one. And it's in that short period of upsizing from one to the other through the peeler and softback stages that most fish are both willing and able to add crab to the diet. Very few fish are going to turn the nose up at a nice softy or peeler crab, as evidenced not only by the way anglers often clean up with a whole raft of species including bass, ray, smooth hounds and cod, but also by the lengths that crabs are forced to go to to keep themselves off the menu when they're at this vulnerable peeler and soft back stage. Probably because crab is not as regularly used or as widely available as some of the other baits, and because it can take a certain amount of know-how and time input to ensure a reliable supply, a mystique has grown up around the whole subject, and in some cases, even a reluctance and fear of what many acknowledge as being arguably the ultimate bait. Something which hopefully this interview with Merseyside small boat angler and Scottish international Mickey Duff will help to dispel. But before Mick explains what he does to ensure a manipulated continuous source of peeler crabs for bait, it might help to give a little bit of background knowledge to the wives and workforce of the whole peeling process, so that hopefully his side of the story might make a little more sense. Crabs belong to a class of animals known as crustaceans, all of which have external skeletons which have to be periodically discarded and renewed in a process known as ecdysis. What happens is that when the animal within grows too big for its existing armour, hormones trigger the development of a new, bigger, soft skin which lies like a wrinkled sheet underneath the old shell. When the time comes right, which is usually as the weather warms up and again at the end of the summer growing season, calcium ions are absorbed from the outer shell into the blood for later recycling, which is why the shell of a crab that's about to peel feels so crispy and thin. When the new skin beneath is ready, the crab then starts to take on copious amounts of water to swell itself up, in order that the upper shell or carapace bursts around its seams. This then lifts up like a lid that's hinged along its front edge, allowing the soft skin crab inside to very slowly work itself free over a period of up to an hour or more. Once outside, it takes on water again to stretch its soft wrinkled skin which can be up to 30% bigger, after which those calcium ions held in the blood are redeposited, causing the soft skin to slowly harden over a period of maybe a week or more. Obviously, during this time, and in particular when the crab is actually vacating its old shell, it's at its most vulnerable, which is why it needs to hide either under a rock, buried in the mud, or, as will be explained shortly, in a purpose-built crab trap. Only when the female, which will be cradled underneath a waiting male, has shed her old skin can she be mated, and to ensure she attracts that mate, she emits a specific chemical message known as a pheromone, which is said that predatory fish are also able to detect and follow up. Right, Mick, to help set the angling side of the story, how highly do you rate crab as both a boat and a shore angling bait? Well, if I was fishing a competition, I wouldn't go to a competition without it. You've got to have it to be successful to catch fish off the beach, especially in the summer. If you haven't got peeled crab, don't bother even going. Don't even bother turning up. Now, that would be my answer to the uh, peeler. You've got to have it. It's a must. Is that the same for the boat as well? Same for the boat as well. In the summer, same for the boat. Must have it. It's a must have bait. If you haven't got it, then the other boats will just beat you every time. What range of species are we talking about here? And over what seasonal time expanse do you see it as being absolutely essential? You can use it all year round, even frozen in the, in the winter for the cod. The cod love it in the winter. But it's a 12 month bait. And for the summer, 
You name the species, that'll take it. It'll take everything. Take place. Dabs, flounders, love it. Silver eels, love it. Thornbacks will take it. Bass will take it. Smooth hounds, dead and must. You won't catch it. Then without it, everything, everything in the river will take it. What about outside the river? And outside on the banks. You, you'll need it for the rays. And are the times when only crab will get you fish? You say that during the winter months the cod will also readily take them, but as we both know, cod are just as likely to take a reasonably wide range of other baits too. What I'm looking for here are species and situations where crab or nothing else will do. Early on in the season, May, bass will only take the crab early on when they first come in. They, they come in for the crab. From what I can gather, they come in for, just for the crab. You might pick an odd one up, but very rarely. If you haven't got the crab, you won't pick them up. They, they seem to just go for the crab straight away. Though limited supplies of peeler crab can be bought in on a year-round basis, for most anglers, the use of crab has a seasonal element to it, which can start and end either earlier or later, depending on where in the country you live. When do you expect to see the first peelers in collectible numbers up here in the northwest, and how long does that usually last? We start getting them in round about beginning of April to the end of April. You'll you'll get a few each week. You'll, you'll start start getting them really really thick and fast in at mid May. To be here then right the way through to round about the end of July and the beginning of August, and then start to peter out then, and you start to go scarce and into September. And then we get a little flurry then at the end of September, October, when the big males start to go again. We start to get um, a bigger malt before they just disappear altogether till the following year. We get all the males early on in the year. All the big males peel first. They start going at the beginning of April, May, June, and then July. They stop and all the females start peeling then. And then they carry on for the rest of the summer. And then at the end of the year, the, the big males start to go again. And we get another, another good peel of males then at the end of the year. In uh, probably October, maybe the weather's fine. Might get a few into November. And then that's it then, gone. The next ones will be the following April. Obviously, there are many different approaches to obtaining crab as a source of bait, including turning rocks and looking in other suitable hiding places when a fishing trip comes up. But you, plus a growing number of other anglers who use crab on a regular basis, have taken this one stage further by setting up traps and having a crab control set up to slow down and speed up the numbers available on demand, almost on an industrial scale. Now I know that for some reason, the use of crab as a bait makes a lot of sea anglers nervous, probably due to a lack of affordable availability with the knock-on effect that people are low to experiment. So the thought of trying to manage and control what is in effect an unstoppable biological process is for some people a step too far. And yet, when you know what you're doing, it is quite a simple technique. Perhaps then you could slowly talk us through it, starting with the traps themselves. What we do, we put tyres down. Um, get the old tyres from the tyre depot, cut two holes in them, and then we lay them in strings of up to 30, 30 in a row, roped together from between posts, staked down in the mud. And then we just leave them for a few weeks and then as the crabs start to come in, we check them every day, sometimes twice a day. We go down, check them at uh, low water, and sometimes we get 50, 100 a tide. The crabs go in them to peel, and we just go down and scoop them out. And we just keep adding a few tyres here and there until we've got maybe 100, 100 tyres down and check them every day. So what attracts both the crabs and you with your traps to any particular length of shoreline as opposed to any other? You must have something specific in mind that you're looking for when trapping time comes around. They're best off in the soft mud. If you can put them in soft mud or just in small pools where they're just covered with water for all the whole length of the tide, down right down to low water and back up again. They seem to congregate in, in the pools and that seems the best place to put them. Put them in the mud uh, which warm, seems to warm up quicker than uh, the mud, and they seem to peel better in the mud. As the mud starts to get warm, they start to pile into the traps, and that's when we go down and get them. Potentially, there are other types of trap too. You've already said that your preference is for tyres, but just to complete the picture, what other types of traps have you seen in use? Gutters. Half-round gutters cut up into lengths of about 18 inches long, just shoved into the mud at an angle of about... 
30 degrees or something like that. Put them in rows all the way along the mud and then just check them every day. The crabs go right down underneath into the corners of the gutters and we just scoop them out. That's basically the two two main ones, is the gutters and, and the tyres. And do you ever have any problems from other people going down and robbing them? Um, not really, no. Most of the lads have got their own little patches. They look at, you know, they've got their own tyres down. And they tend to just do their own tyres. Sometimes we do, but not very often. Seems to be like a, a little bit of a, a law between the anglers that if the tyres uh, haven't been done by low water, then it's acceptable for somebody to come down and do them. But most times, no, nobody really bothers. For completeness, if you just wanted to collect up a few crabs for a trip, where and how would you go about that? Well, it would be a hard graft. You'd have to go along all the rocks, turning the rocks over. You'd have to do a lot of a lot of ground just to get a few. Backbreaking work, turning rocks over, scurrying around the mud. A lot of area to cover, and a real hard job. Right then, so we'll stick with the trapping. You're down there in the mud with your chest waders on, and you poke your marigold gloved hand inside a tyre where you find a crab. Now every crab you find isn't necessarily going to be a peeler. Hardback males, for example, will also be attracted in by the pheromones of females preparing to peel and looking for a mate. As peeling is a progressive process, with not all the crabs going at exactly the same time, how early in that process can you identify a crab that will be of interest to you, and just exactly what are you looking for? Well, we usually go by the colour. After you've been doing it for quite a while, you can usually tell by the colour. Colour starts to fade underneath and go like a grey-white. Just by experience, you can tell. If you can't tell by the colour, all you do is just snap the last segments on the back leg off, pull it apart, and you'll see the little brown leg inside, and that's ready to go, ready to be taken. Sometimes you can break the leg off and you've got a little green, wispy, thin leg underneath, which means that it's starting to peel, but it's not ready it's not ready to be taken. It'll only die in the fridge after a few weeks. So you might as well just leave it and put it back and then try for another one. Once the legs have started to turn a little brownie soft wisp inside, and you know they're ready to take. But I, I, I can tell by just looking at the colour. The colour changes dramatically. You can just tell by picking it up. You can just look at it and you know it's a peeler. Plus you'll, you'll never get any female peelers early on in the year. You can get 50 females out of the out of a tyre and you just know that none of them will be peeling. It's just the wrong time of the year for the females. You don't even check them. You just put them back. So how do you tell the difference between the sexes? Uh, by the flaps. If you turn them over underneath, the male's got like a pointed flap and female's got a, a wider, rounder flap. Plus you can tell by the colours, usually by the shape of the shell as well. Yeah. And sometimes you can, I can feel, I can tell under, before I pulled it out the side, I can tell that it's a female, and I haven't even got it out yet. <laughs> now you've mentioned colour as a surefire way of identifying crabs that are going to be of interest to you, which is fine when you have that level of experience. But there is another way that some crabs give themselves away, which absolutely nobody can mistake or miss. You will on occasion pick up a male crab that isn't ready to peel, cradling the female beneath it that is, because when she pops, that's when they can mate. The carriers, yeah. That's when the females start to go later on. The males will pick them up and carry them. Not too long before they peel, actually. And you can just tell straight away. You can just pick the male up and take the female out from underneath. There's no, there's even any need to check it. Once the male picks it up and carries it with the shell facing upwards, it'll be a peeler. Guaranteed. Put your money on it. Now, if you pick it up and it's upside down, then it'll be a soft back. It'll have already peeled and it's best left alone to breed. So even though they'll still take plenty of fish, you don't bother with the softies then? Not very often. Not very. If the peelers are really scarce, then we might take a few softies, big softies for the for the bass. But normally we won't take. We let them just let them breed, let them get on with it. So how early in the peeling process are you able to identify potential baits, and what is the best day to be taking them out for holding back? Best day to find them out is when they've got a decent leg inside, which is nearly developed but it's quite soft. That's the best time to get them. You know they're going to go then within days. They're going to be ready for use. So what you're looking for then are crabs on the verge of being ready to use, then taking them home where they can be manipulated to finally be ready on demand. That's, that's it, yeah. Once you've got them in it, back home, you just sort them out. You tend to get the ones that have 
really pale. You can you can tell by the the back starting to just lift. The two little um, pieces of shell underneath the, the front, if you just touch them, you just got a little bit of give in them. You know they're going to go within a few days and just keep them separate. Then that's just put in a tray with a bit of seaweed, a bit of damp paper, and you can slow them down and they'll keep for at least a month. And just take them out as you need them. If, you, if you're going out tomorrow, just take them out and put them in some water out of the fridge and then take the, take the ones that are popping out and then put the rest back in again. We seem to be getting a bit ahead of ourselves here, and I want people listening to be absolutely certain of what the exact process is. So you've just picked up a crab that you're going to keep. How do you maintain them in good order down on the shore? And is there anything else you need to do to them, or anything you need to collect or take back, such as fresh seawater, before heading home? I just put them in the bucket till I get home, just pile them all in. Give them a good swill, I get all the mud off them. Put a bit of weed in the bucket and just bring them home as they are in the bucket all together. And do you take any seawater home with you as well? Yeah, I bring a container home, and I just use that as and when I need it. So you've arrived home with a bucket full of crabs and a container of fresh seawater. Presumably, they then need sorting and grading before putting into the fridges for holding back. So what are the determining factors here, and how does the holding back procedure work? When we get them home, you can tell, you can just, just touch the shells, you can feel the shells just starting to give, and you just put all them in one tray separate. They, you know they're going to be going within the next few days. You use them for the weekend. And I just put all the rest in the uh, trays. And then just, I check them every day. I just go through them and just feel them. Any that are coming on, uh, I'll, I'll move to another tray ready. And they just keep coming. The next day, day I go down, I get another 30, 40. Sort them out. I'll put them in in the fridge and it's just like a production line of crab coming through each day I check them every day don't leave them for for the day and say oh I won't do it today because if one dies and it's it starts to stink the, the place out so I check them every day and just move them on tray by tray when the crabs are in the trays do you put anything over them to keep them damp to stop the gills drying out and to prevent them from escaping when they go into the fridge I usually put um, either you seaweed but I've, I'm a bit dubious on the seaweed. If the seaweed's in for a week or two, then it starts to go off, and you've got to change it. But I've got to use it in newspaper, fold it over, soak it in water, put them over the top of them, and then all I need to do then is, is give them a, take the paper back off, give it another swill in the seawater, just replace it, and, and that, that keeps them fine. They keep for weeks like that. Do you have to use a specific temperature setting for the fridge, or is it just the normal two or three you'd have it on for keeping food in the kitchen at home? Just the usual. Whatever I feel, I just feel it. Feel it. If it's right, I can just tell. You don't want it too cold, otherwise they, they just stop altogether and nothing happens to them. And in the end, they just sort of peter out and just keep it nicely and just keep them coming. Keep them so that they're just moving around. They're not actually comatose with the cold. Obviously, the ones that were nearest to peeling when you found them are going to go first, with the rest presumably following on like a conveyor. But what lengths of time are we talking about here for hauling them back and bringing them on to have a constant supply? I've kept them for up to four weeks, five weeks sometimes, six weeks, probably maximum. Let's say then that the early weather prospects look good for a settled spell at the weekend, and there are plenty of bass and smoothhounds out along the edges of the Mersey revetment wall. So you know in advance that you're going to want plenty of peelers. How much notice do you need them to have them ready for a specific day, and what is the process of bringing them on? Exactly. What I'll do, I'll pick all the ones out that are near enough going, and then I'll keep them in a cooler part of the fridge, and then the others I'll take them all out. If we've gone out for a really long day, I'll take the whole lot out of the fridge, I'll put them in big containers in the back, in the sunshine, and then I just tip some seawater in them, and just I'll just leave them to run around in the in the in the actual containers, and then I'll go through them every couple of hours, and I find you'll find that it'll start to lift, and I just take them out and put them back in the in the fridge with the others, and just keep taking them out as they're starting to go, and I put them back in the fridge, and keep them, and then when when I've got enough, I'll just put them all take them all back and put them all back in the fridge again in the trays, and just leave them there then till the following week or. But I still sift through them every day. And it's the drink of water here that's the key. They need to take plenty on board and swell up inside the old suit of armour to pop the top shell along its seams. 
But it's the water that makes them shed. If they're dry, then you, they won't. It takes them a lot longer. But I just keep them nice and moist. If they're too dry, they tend to go slimy. The shells seem to pick up a slimy mud, like a, a sticky, horrible slime on, on the shells underneath. I just like to keep them nice and fresh. A bit of a fresh seawater each day, just to get them through the gills, and that's all you need. And what happens then if nearer the weekend the weather forecast suddenly starts to change for the worse? Can you slow them down again? Or are you suddenly stuck with a load of quality baits and nowhere to go? If they've gone too far, then you're going to have to freeze them with the shells. One time we used to peel them, take the lungs out, take the legs off. Now, with all I do, I just wait till the back's crack, throw them in a bag, and just tie a knot in the bag. They're absolutely perfect when they come out. But there's only one, one secret to, to make them perfect when they come out, and that's to put them in salt water before they thaw out, and let them thaw out slowly in the water. Don't just let them thaw out themselves. They'll go black and they'll go horrible. Just put them in the seawater and just leave them to, to thaw out themselves. When you open them up, you think you just got them up to size. Perfect. So, the big day comes along and the crabs are all ready. What do you do to transport and keep them in tip-top condition from the moment you leave home until they're needed out there in the boat? Always cooler boxes. Always take them out in cooler boxes. Put the uh, ice packs on the bottom... Put a layer of wet newspaper over the cooler packs and then just put the crabs in there, over the top of them. And just put them in little layers, about a dozen, then put another layer of paper on and another dozen. But don't pack them in too much, too hard like. And uh, they'll keep all day perfect then and just take them out as you need them. Otherwise, they'll just all pop in the day. Before you even halfway through the day, you'll find them all, they're all popped and gone. It's amazing how quickly they can pop in it when, when you get out in the, in the sun and... It, it just go. And what do you do with any that's left over at the end of the trip? Well, then again, I'll bring them back and I'll freeze them again. Well, I won't freeze them again, but I'll, I'll freeze them for the winter for the car. The next big thing on the agenda is presentation. I fish with yourself and John Greenfield for the bass, and I know that you both have different approaches to hooking them up, and I'm certain there will be other approaches out there too. So if you will, talk us through your approach from taking the crab out of the cool box to throwing it out towards the fish. I just peel all the shell off it and the legs, make sure there's nothing on it. Sometimes I take the lungs out, sometimes I don't. I don't know why. And then I'll just cut it three quarters of the way through the body, halfway along. So I've got two halves joined together in the middle. Thread the hook through the first half, and then through the second half, and then just pull it up, pull it onto the hooking one. No elasticated thread? No elasticated thread at all, no. I don't use elasticated thread unless I really have to. It seems to pull the hook back on itself sometimes when it's wrapped around the hook. The hook sometimes turns on itself. And uh, I'm not too not too stuck on the... And what about when you're fishing for, say, smooth hounds or cod? Do you ever just remove the top shell and put the rest of the crab on the hook hole? For the smooth hounds, yeah. Sometimes just take the top shell off and that's it. Just hook it straight through the middle then for the smooth hounds. Just leave all the legs hanging over the side. Don't bother peeling them completely. And when you're removing the legs, what do you do with those? Dump them or use them? Keep the legs, yeah, use the legs, just tip off with the legs. Especially with the big crabs, not the small ones though. But the big crabs, is just put three or four legs on the, on the end of the hook. And now for the final question. How important to you is having crab? And how highly do you rate it compared to other baits for fish that are willing to eat a wide range of food items including fish, squid and worm? Very important. If I hadn't got it, sometimes I wouldn't go out. I wouldn't bother. It's that important. It's not worth sometimes going through the effort of going out for the full day if you haven't got it. Some species of fish like crabs so much that they've evolved specific adaptations to not have to wait for them to go through the peeling stage. They're capable of taking them as and when they find them, hard shells and all, though obviously they're not going to turn the noses up at either a nice juicy peeler or a softy. The River Mersey, for example, is stuffed full of the things whenever water temperature allows them to stay, which in a mild winter can be right throughout the main cod season. How often, when you go to winter cod, do you find hardback crabs inside the stomachs? Yet everyone seems to say that hardbacks are next to useless as bait. It's at this stage that I'd like to bring in my boat partner Charlie Pitchers, who might be able to cast some doubt on that particular line of thought. I was fishing in the Mersey, catching one or two cod, and then brought a cod which had a, an hardback crab in its mouth. So uh, I retrieved the uh, hardback crab out of its mouth, I thought I'll see if I can catch a few more fish with the hardback crab and uh, managed to catch another 
three coddling off the same one hard back crab and then on uh, other trips managed to catch um, other coddling by first uh, at the slack water catching some hard back crab and uh, just squash them a little bit with the ball of my foot. The way I hooked them is through their uh, leg sockets uh, which uh, gives you a good uh, hook hold as well and uh, consequently catching a few more cod which uh, is always worthwhile doing it and uh, gives you the chance of a, a different bait when uh, the crabs are naturally feeding on your uh, your soft baits which you're putting down at slack water and uh, a good way of uh, catching codling and uh, probably other fish as well which should take the hard back crabs because uh, the fish are definitely feeding on them so there you have it hopefully now some of the mystique at least will have been removed all that remains now is to say a very big thank you to Mick Duff and Charlie Pitches for their input. Mm -hmm.